<laughs> I was busy too. So, uh, good to have you here. So uh, again, the room is slowly filling up. So uh, thanks for joining our discussion uh, and just for why we are here. So uh, the debate on post-growth perspectives for the society economy is vastly accelerating. We had a similar setting, another roundtable with guests here in Dortmund two years ago on the last Dortmund conference, more focused on Germany, Central Europe. Now we are international. We'll come to that a bit later, what that means. Because post-growth thinking, post-growth acting is no longer only something for a small niche for some crazy people for very small communities, for local neighborhoods, and for some islands of alternative thinkers and doers. But it's a thing for all of us, for all of us in the audience here, a thing for the audience we had two years ago at another round table, um, and it's increasingly challenging our planning thought. So what might post-growth planning be? For us, it might be a planning in which growth is neither a necessary starting point nor, nor a goal that must be achieved. A planning that works on change, but not centers on growth. One that works on quality of life, but not with more of the same old growth solutions. And most importantly, one in which planners engage and which planners motivate. So um, who is us? It's uh, the two of us. It's uh, Christian Lanker from University of Groningen. It's myself. It's uh, Viola Schulze-Dika from TU Dortmund. And there is one person supporting us in the background today. It's Kim von Schönfeld from uh, Wageningen University in Research. So in, on the behalf of my colleagues, I want to warmly say hello to all of you, but also to our digital audience. So it's, everything is lightly streamed online, like there's a camera here. So not just our yeah, beautiful and amazing uh, guest speakers here to see you. So there's an online streaming link, and so people can see you as well. And everything is recorded. So we can have, like, maybe use the footage for further publication, um, publication um, purposes. So today we have our four guest speakers, and they will briefly um, yeah, start with a short statement on how they look at uh, post-growth planning and say a little bit about their backgrounds and get into a lively discussion and all of you are invited to join the whole discussion a little later by yeah, raising your hand and saying something or if you may be shy or you want to do it differently you can write us a note on um, frag.yes and you have a number given on the front of the, on the blackboard it's uh, given there, so you can enter an online uh, platform and you can write your question there. And the two of us and Kim, who's supporting us in the background, we will um, delegate the questions to our guest speakers. But um, yeah, for now, I would like to maybe start uh, with Christian Schulz from Luxembourg. Please start with your statement and hello. Yeah, yes. hello. Good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear me well. I'm working at the University of Luxembourg, which is not that far from Dortmund, but I deliberately abstained from attending the conference upon the uh, organizers' request. So I, I uh, <coughs> jointly uh, joined you remotely. Um, I'm working in the Department of Geography and Spatial Planning. I'm an economic geographer by training, and I've been working on post growth issues since a couple of years now. And I get more and more interested in how this could actually translate into, into planning practices, to what extent post-growth thinking could influence or inspire planning and bring us to other takes on spatial development uh, policies. Um, for, for me, post-growth planning does not only mean to question the notion of growth as such. It has further implications on the underlying models, our concepts, our methodology, if you like, the indicators we use to evaluate spatial development processes, um, economic success, for example, and not least also our terminology, so the terms we use to describe what we do. Um, this becomes probably most obvious in the, in the example of what we understand by the economy. Usually it's something formally organized enterprises uh, trading goods and services with, with each other or with private households. Barkett may 
market-based exchange of goods and services. And we only rarely think of the economy as a much broader concept encompassing all sorts of uh, volunteering, all sorts of care, family care activities and the like which are usually not measured by any economic statistics and not relevant for GDP or other core indicators we, we use. So if we rethink this notion of the economy and include other factors, other elements contributing to our well-being and to social wealth, um, this has obvious implications on how we think about planning, about regional development, what kind of targets we set, what kind of goals we define, think of traditional indicators such as job creation or patterns or the like, they have a very limited understanding of what kind of economy constitutes our our societies. So probably I'll leave it there for the moment as a first as a first input. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. So I would like to ask Yvonne Dryden from London to continue. Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm Yvonne Ryden. I'm from the Bartlett School of Planning um, at University College London, uh, where I teach broadly and um, research on uh, governance for sustainability, I think uh, fairly, fairly broadly. So we, we were asked to make a proposition. My proposition is that post-growth planning will require a new kind of knowledge. Um, and I've been very interested in, in the knowledge base of planning for a long time now. Um, it's widely acknowledged that planning is a knowledge-led activity where expertise of different kinds interfaces with people and organizations' desires and interests. The kind of knowledge that is implicated in a planning system tells you a lot about that planning system, I believe. Growth-oriented planning uses growth to deliver on public interest goals and to do so utilizes knowledge of the capacities of infrastructure systems and other public sector resources, thereby delivering land, development, and infrastructure, uh, sorry, land development, and hopefully balanced economic growth. Growth dependent planning, which I've written about, goes further and prioritizes knowledge of market processes and outcomes, of land values and development gains, of supply and demand. It does so in order to pursue a form of growth that is itself seen as dependent on property development. However, neither of these approaches and their associated knowledge sets are suitable in the absence of growth or the absence of the ability to generate growth. And I think there are increasing areas we find across the world um, that fit that category. Such circumstances, I think, demand new forms of knowledge, uh, looking beyond the assumed capacities of the state or the market. Planning processes have tended to downplay the need to gather intelligence on the capacities outside formal public and economic processes. They've also tended to favor specific forms of such intelligence, such as the aggregate, the statistical picture, uh, the trends, the, the modeling output and so on. And this can be at the expense of looking into the micro practices of life in localities. I would argue that in situations of no growth that we're considering today, it becomes more important than ever to understand these minutiae of everyday life as urban transformation through public or private investment remains a remote possibility. And I would suggest there are three new kinds of knowledge needed in a post-growth world. First, deepening our understanding, and by our I'm, I'm talking about the planner's perspective, deepening the planner's understanding of local social capital and the capacities of NGOs in local civil society. Second, appreciating the functioning and capacities of local communities through the skills, time, and other resources that are available, i.e. the things that are outside the measurement of GDP that Christian was talking about. And thirdly, tracing the role of local and small businesses in generating good services and driving the local circulation of capital um, with uh, my view is that, that the role of small businesses have, has often been under considered uh, and under measured. So my argument is that such knowledge would provide a new basis for a different kind of planning system, neither oriented to nor dependent on economic growth. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I'd like to ask Jim from Norway to continue, please. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Hopefully, yes. Um, my name is Jin. I'm an urban planning scholar in Norwegian University of Life Sciences uh, in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. 
And I have been doing research on grain growth and degrowth in the fields of housing and urban development for many years, since 2009. Um, generally, I'm very critical of the urban development and planning paradigm that is dominated by the growth and the grain growth agenda. But meanwhile, I'm also very critical of the special imaginations made by some mainstream degrowth thinkers and their attitudes to planning. Therefore, I have been um, attempting at engaging a dialogue between degrowth and urban planning. So my statement about uh, post-degrowth planning is that um, it needs ideological and structural transformations, which should take place both within the planning field and at the societal level. So if planning is going to be the vanguard of social change, it has to be transformed from inside in the first place. And that includes an ideology dimension and a structural dimension. So first of all, ideology, it constitutes our dominant belief system that in turn shapes what we value, aim for, and what we do to achieve the aims. Planning could be uh, we could say the planning is the ideology of how we define and use the space. This, the ideological commitment of planning has a significant consequence to the purpose of planning in a specific context and the choice of planning strategies. Planning's ideological belief in neoliberal capitalism fortifies a neoliberal growth society. A shift from the belief in growth to well-being will considerably change the formulation of planning goals and actions. Apart from subverting mainstream planning ideology, structural changes within the planning field have to be done as well. And this includes revising the legal framework, such as planning law and regulations, transforming planning procedures, inventing alternative planning methods, for, in, for instance, use scenario planning to replace the uh, growth-oriented cost-benefit analysis and the traffic models. However, planning is located within the wider dynamic um, po um, political, institutional, economic, and cultural context. This context defines the structural position of planners and shape their power, opportunities, and limitations. Being positioned within the growth-oriented political and economic landscape, planning's action space for transformative practices are very constrained. For example, plan planning's dependence on the growth model in urban development is a result of the institutional setting of land and property ownership, as well as the political ideology of neoliberalism that deregulates the market. Therefore, an ideological and structural problem at the societal level conditions planners' potentials for pursuing a post-growth society. But on the other hand, it is precisely because of this inside position of planning in the political setting that planners are advantages in confronting directly the established practices and values. Based on the strengths attached to planners' structures position, planners can engage in strategic interaction with other corporate agents to build alliances in order to attain joint and mutually compatible goals. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jin. And now we go all the way to Australia. I need to Nelson, please. Thank you very much. Yes. So I'm an Australian activist scholar whose work ranges across many different aspects of sustainability. I'm affiliated with the Centre for Urban Research at RMIT University that's in Melbourne, in Victoria, and our centre is part of an environment and planning department, so sometimes uh, I've taught planners. I co-edited uh, Housing for Deep Growth, Principles, Models, Challenges and Opportunities, which has an excellent chapter in it by Jin. And I wrote a book on eco-collaborative housing called Small is Necessary, Shared Living on a Shared Planet. And they were both released in 2018 and range across many of the kinds of topics that we'll be discussing today. Uh, Vincent Léger 
and I are completing a book that's called Exploring Deep Growth, a Critical Guide, that's a, a very broad book on deep growth, but is relevant because I think that post-growth or degrowth really uh, is difficult for us to handle because it impacts on practically every aspect of our lives. Um, that book's going to be launched at the 7th International Degrowth Conference in Manchester in September this year. My statement is post-growth planning needs to apply criteria enabling citizens to live one planet footprint. But these are very stringent. So global north planners need to be political and politicising. And to just go into that a little bit more deeply, a one planet footprint is a controversial indicator, but I think it's one of the most highly visible and rigorous indicators on which we might base post growth futures. So for instance, when I was looking at writing small is necessary, I I I latched on to the one planet footprint because I could only find this as one that was being readily applicable across the various different eco-collaborative communities that I was looking at. Now, uh, members of the Zurich Young Cooperative uh, Housing and Living Project have created a kind of fit-for-purpose lifestyle calculation that's based on Swiss National One Planet Footprint Assessment. And uh, in a English language uh, proposal that's been written by one of the Young co Housing Cooperative and Living Projects member, Hans Widmer, uh, he creates a kind of what he calls a typical lifestyle menu. So one of the really difficult aspects of dealing with indicators such as one planet footprint are that we still want to have lots of flexibility in the different kinds of things that we do in our lives, in our activities and in our consumption. But just as an example, and to give an indication of the kind of uh, limitations that might be on our level of consumption, I'll read you out this typical lifestyle menu. 20 square metres of private living space, 2.5 square metres of communal space. And of course, if you share your space with 25 others, that's 50 square metres. More or less no cars and no flights. Six kilometres of train travel per capita every day. A boat, a boat voyage of, say, 1,000 kilometres a year. 15 kilograms of meat per year, 20 litres of milk per year, 70 litres of water daily. And remember that that 70 litres will cover you washing your clothes, washing all of your dishes and uh, washing yourself as well as your preparation of all of your food and what you're actually doing. Three hours of internet per week <laughs> and one newspaper that's daily shared between fifty people. So um, they underscore that you know citizens can make choices. For instance, I don't eat any meat at all, um, but uh, then one is able to spend a little bit more on one of the other kinds of activities. But the really interesting thing is they're doing that because they're trying to design housing cooperatives, and these are eco-collaborative housing cooperatives where people are sharing spaces so that they enable citizens to live as comfortably as possible within those kinds of limits. And I think that this is very much the kinds of um, approach that we need to be taking to planning because... We've just had some really great statements about indicators and knowledge and about the holistic activities within space. With universal categories, us as planners, 
can be need to be looking very seriously at the kind of suite of applications of that. And I think that this is probably one of the aspects that is uh, really important for us to be looking at. But I'm really concerned with whether we understand exactly how severe these limits are. That might mean that our urban spaces are extremely different in terms of car transport infrastructure that we have today, for instance. Uh, and so I think we're looking at quality of life that's also very involved in the environment, but it's also trying to be quality of life for everyone. So we're looking at addressing inequalities as well as environment. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you very much to everyone and all your beautiful statements that come from all different perspectives. And I saw that you were already writing down some ideas probably, and I would like to ask you if you have questions to the other person that you maybe haven't met yet or haven't had the chance to ask something personally or according to the statement. I would like to ask to give you the word. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I can't see who you're pointing at, <laughs> so I wasn't quite sure. Uh, it's a question to Anitra, really, because I, I, I found that very compelling, your statement. Um, it seemed to be addressed very much to high-income, high-consumption societies. Um, and I was wondering how you uh, finessed that or, or dealt with the, the inequalities within such societies. Because um, the kind of thing that I'm, I'm interested in researching at the moment is, is looking at the, the areas where there is limited growth, where there's low income, there's precarious living, precarious employment. There's often very poor health opportunities as well. Um, and, and a situation which I see, I find planning seems rather powerless and I'm trying to think through how it can operate in these low growth situations. But I, I'd be very interested to hear how you applied your one planet living metric um, when you're looking at inequalities within high income societies? So the idea is, is, is that people um, on high incomes are actually starting to live much more modest lifestyles. And I, I, I agree with you, inequality is a massive problem. And that is why such massive change is required. So you, you see a transfer happening within high-income societies? Yes, I think that has to happen. Jim, Jim. Yeah. Um, thank you. And I have a question to Yvonne. Um, I think in your, in your statement, you emphasize a lot about the importance of recognizing and, and employing and understanding the local capital and uh, the, the local communities as a way to move away from the growth dependent and the oriented planning. Um, I just wonder, do you suppose that the solution to post growth lies mostly at the local level? And could, also, could it also be a risk that the locals do not necessarily represent a non-growth force? I think we, we, there are some also discussions about uh, local traps and how how can we avoid that kind of local trap. And another thing is about this uh, three knowledges. Um, yeah, and I'm also thinking this knowledge uh, um, of the the potential impacts of planning impacts that can fulfill a post growth society or values. I think maybe we also need this type of knowledge because especially about this uh, inequity, inequality issue, and it's really challenging to achieve social equity with unlimited resources. And that's a challenge that different from achieving social equity within, with economic growth. So I think we basically lack this kind of knowledge as well. Sorry, can, can you just repeat what, what kind of knowledge you mean in, the, in, in this case? Um, I think it's important to, to know about uh, the knowledge of the potential impacts of planning 
strategies um, okay. because this impacts they yeah. can um, conflict with each other when it comes cool. social equity and sustainability. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I, I want to draw a distinction between um, the what has been mainly covered in the literature in terms of local knowledge, community-based knowledge, which is the kind of knowledge the community wishes to put forward. Um, which therefore is associated with the idea of very bottom-up planning as coming from what local communities want. And I think you're right, we can't be sure what local communities want, and they may not want no growth, absolutely. Um, but that's not really the kind of knowledge I'm talking about. I'm talking more about the reorienting the expert knowledge that you find within the planning system uh, in order to enable one to improve situations in localities where there is currently no growth, so um, you know, and that could that could be very different from lay knowledge, experiential knowledge, all these kind of knowledges that, that planning theory particularly likes to emphasise. Um, but my argument is that if you go to situations of low growth, there is still a need to to do planning. There's still a need to improve quality of life of local residents, and that expert planners, planning led. Um, activity doesn't actually have the right kind of knowledge to do it. And this is partly about the way in which you mobilize local resources, whether they're social, politically or economic, um, as opposed to relying on more globalized resources and making the case for um, attracting, say, mobile capital um, in that kind of way. Nothing I'm saying suggests that you that it should be a localized planning system. I, I think it's a very strong idea to have national planning frameworks that embody some of these ideas um, and that that should slow down. It, it's more that the, we've been so used to having the knowledge um, that we base our local planning activities on really be based around things like GDP, gross value added, you know, which carries with it all the ideological resonances you were talking about, Jin. So it's a, it's a slightly different argument than you're implying. Yeah, maybe, maybe Christian can help us out here. Like, how could we deal with indicators and measures to get closer to a, reframe the economy to um, maybe better deal with these local inequalities that I knew for the, uh, Yvonne are started in their discussion? Do you see a perspective there? Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not sure that I can help, but what the, 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 the clash Yvonne just described, the clash between um, the, the, the professional planning, as it, as it were, and the, this new uh, locally emerging uh, knowledge in, in the particular context she described, um, this clash has probably to do with the fact that planning overlooks some of those ephemeral activities or new knowledge knowledge sets. And uh, I think this refers to what, 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 what both Anitra and, and Shin also mentioned in, in, their, in, their, opening, in their opening statements that uh, that by, by doing, by practicing new lifestyles or by using new forms of housing and co-housing and the like, new knowledge, I like the term knowledge here, uh, Yvonne, new knowledge is created, which probably doesn't perfectly fit with the, the textbook models and theories and indicator systems we are using in planning and, and, and beyond. So obviously that's 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 one of the key uh, key points here I think to to broaden our, our understanding on how to evaluate what's happening in those local or regional communities and to what extent this should inform or inspire planning and development um, strategies. And if I may add a question to Anitra at this at this point, um, your I, I found your 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 proposition quite quite compelling. Um, this one planet lifestyle thing, uh, it could be misunderstood as being a self-restricting, self-limiting individual, deliberate action taken by us individuals. And I, I was wondering where the role of planning could be in this, in this endeavor. Would you see planning as a facilitator for the new lifestyles you describe, the sharing surface, for the shared surface, for example, when it comes to housing? Um, or the infrastructure you, you mentioned, transport facilities. Would you would you then plead for a more proactive role of planning in enabling individuals to practice this kind of lifestyles? Or yes, definitely. I think that we desperately need a collective approach because uh, throughout history we've had many people who've chosen to live modestly and in voluntary simplicity. 
and it hasn't necessarily changed society. But now we're facing uh, uh, ever-growing uh, emissions and climate change, which is really just the tip of the iceberg of environmental crises. So basically, as a planet of people, we need to be addressing these uh, problems. And I see planners and the fact that they're needing to look at a, a big unit of people, as in a city, uh, as a really good position to actually imagine what are the large transformations that need to be taking place. And I was thinking, Yvonne, that in terms of disadvantaged areas, I think that instead of us seeing the commercial and the industrial kinds of development that growth-oriented thinking uh, directs us towards, we're looking at instead at improving social housing and improving green spaces, which, which helps heal the earth as well as improving people's well-being, which is one of Jin's um, important foci. I think we're looking at integrating some of the best of experiments in terms of tactical urbanism or lean urbanism. I think that the planning area and urbanists are actually throwing up very interesting terms and movements in this area. And a lot of it is trying to bridge that gap between uh, individuals and households and neighbourhoods precincts and the larger city, because otherwise, if some of us are very oriented towards minimalising our lifestyles and those people with many more resources than ourselves, they will actually possibly just end up with the inequalities growing rather than diminishing. And we've got to be very careful about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Yvonne, you've ended your statement with uh, that you can somewhat think about or envision a different new planning system based on your thoughts and knowledge. Uh, and what you've laid out. Can you think about how could this new planning system look like or how could they take up the connection between different maybe individuals who start acting differently? Do you see how that fits into a planning system? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit against the idea of a one-size-fits-all policy. I mean, what I do actually think that different kinds of localities need a different kind of approach. Um, so, you know, there may be I mean, e even aligned for the one planet idea, I think there may be points where we want to allow some growth to occur and there may be other areas where we don't. Um, I think, in a sense, is if, if I could give a practical example, perhaps, just to make the links across. I mean, let's take the thing that Christian mentioned about care, the role of care within um, the society and the fact that it's not valued um, and it's therefore doesn't feed into the GDP calculations and there's a strong critique about that, you know, in the history, in the scholarship around the history of, of GDP and GMP and so on. Um, now, that's exactly the kind of thing, resource that um, is, I mean, it's care is based in local resources of time and uh, empathy and uh, willingness to, to look after each other. And those are exactly the kind of resources that I was thinking we need to know, and we need to understand about the extent to which a local community has the capacity to deliver that. So for, perhaps through something like time banks. So the idea of time banks is exactly the kind of idea that Nietzsche was talking about as a kind of tactical urbanism. You know, you get that as happening as initiative in certain places that also can feed through to rethinking what we actually mean by development and, uh, and growth and rethinking our metrics. Um, but to get those to work, we need to understand the local communities. I've been working quite a lot with a, a city in East Anglia, uh, Peterborough, where they're very keen to adopt the ideas of the circular economy within the city as a whole, which is a way of actually, it's, it's not exactly a way of degrowth, but it's a way of actually reducing resource inputs and, and uh, waste and pollution outputs you know, from the economic activity that happens there. And it's very clear that in, in, this is in a city which is not in the wealthiest part of, of the southeast of England at all. Um, that in a sense, you need to look at the resources of the local community um, and I would say local businesses, small businesses, micro businesses as well, 
um, in order to come up with the initiatives. But the question is, how can we as planners and in planning systems try to foster that? And there you are very much bounded, as Jenna said, by the, con the, con the existing legal framework and what, what you can do. And in the UK, I think my analysis of this in the UK is going to come up against the boundaries of what the UK planning system thinks it's about. And that, that may well suggest the reforms of the kind Jim was talking about. Yvonne, um, yeah, how does it look like in all the other countries, for example, in Australia or Melbourne, maybe more local? So I'm involved with um, the planning working group of Co-Housing Australia, which is uh, arguing that uh, we need to improve people's uh, opportunities to be part of co-housing. And, you know, that's an activist group in a sense, um, but we feed where, where planners are uh, and feed into the Planning Institute of Australia newsletters we often get asked to talk about this. There's a lot of interest amongst the public as well as professionals in this kind of area. In terms of um, there being a lot of opportunity, and I, indeed I think a great importance that at the local level we do have differentiation. I think that we need to be part of a movement that is encouraging autonomy at a local level. And, uh, and sort of more participatory democracy so that there's a lot more engagement between planners uh, and, and public or, you know, ourselves in that sense. Yeah. So there's grassroots and top-down engagement which can feed into political discussion where the kind of centres might take off. Maybe Christian? Yeah, I was... I was going to to come to come back to the notion of of of, of democracy you just you just mentioned. If we understand planning as a political process of um, jointly defining uh, development goals for a local or a regional or a national um, co co community, um, this has a lot to postcode has a lot to do with this um, negotiate negotiate negotiating new goals, negotiating what kind of um, development scenarios we, we'd like to put emphasis on, um, uh, negotiations around the, the indicators we use to measure welfare and, and, and well-being. So all those elements, as you mentioned. And, and, and there I see um, a particular, a particular um, opportunity at the local level, not, not overrating the local as as such, we heard about the local trap earlier, but the local as a starting point for um, a new definition of where we want to go in terms of spatial, spatial development. And this obviously includes uh, lay knowledge or new sorts of knowledge uh, Yvonne referred to earlier. And it's not only in the hands of professional planners or local or regional policymakers to decide upon where to go. I think the housing projects are very good example for this kind of self-empowerment of communities who um, fighting against the logics of uh, overheated real estate markets for example try to to create something else and the same the same idea could apply to many other realms um, at, at both the uh, the urban in the urban context or even in rural in rural communities Can you, for example think of a german example that you would like to add I, I, th I think spontaneously I, I would think of the rather strong movement in Germany as to uh, land, land property in cities. So how to, how to regain power over land and uh, what kind of land use, what kind of buildings, what kind of housing uh, we, we, we prefer. It's very much to do with uh, in whose hands is, is the land. And what, what we saw over the last decades in, in Germany and elsewhere in Europe is that public land, land in the hand of the local communities or municipalities was sold out to private developers, developers uh, to large extents. Mm -hmm. And with that, municipalities lost, if you like, kind of power to um, steer those processes. So what we currently see is a, at least an attempt to move back to, to former times for the public had had a stronger say in what's going to happen with, with the land. Yeah, 
Jin, you've explained planners in their very important inside position, able to confront what's possible, confront what's established. Can you give examples or explain how that could help us or how that can bring us forward in the directions we've discussed? Yeah, um, I'm not sure I have a concrete example um, from practice or from Norway, but I can say, um, I think planners, they are, um, they are policy advisors, so they do provide advice to the politicians or decision makers. So then I think, uh, um, therefore, the planners, although they can't make decisions, they are so constrained by their political position, but they do provide, they can develop different uh, urban scenarios, different urban futures based on degrowth values or post-growth values or different uh, or, um, values such as equity or sustainability, that is, uh, alternatives to the growth values. And then they can use these scenarios to inform politicians and the wider publics of different uh, possibilities. So I think that's what planners can do instead of confirming, conforming themselves to the political ideas or values. Um, another thing I'm thinking is that planners can also instead of building consensus, we talk so much about deliberative planning that we need to weigh planners as moderators to build a consensus among stakeholders. I think instead of building consensus, if we want to pursue um, degrowth values, we can build alliances instead of a consensus. So we find, we build alliances with those groups and uh, and uh, uh, stakeholders, maybe their communities at the local levels, and and try to build consensus with them, so they become stronger and powerful in the process of counteracting uh, the growth, the growth uh, alliances, you could say. So I think um, planners uh, can do, can try to pursue these uh, transformative actions through the planning process and. Also, I think deliberation and participation with people is very important if we are going to find um, common interests or shared interests. Yeah, thank you. Can, can I? To, uh, wait, thanks to all of you first, because now we are back to planners. And our great advantage is that we have a group of planners sitting right here in the room. So at this point, we are kind of half through. So we would like to open the um, this uh, discussion to the audience here in our room in Dortmund. So whoever is here and has a question, please raise your hand. We also see questions coming in through uh, frag.yes. So feel free to ask online, but first, is there someone in the room wanting to add a question here? There's one in the front. Uh, thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm not very uh, familiar with the uh, post growth uh, uh, system uh, concept, but uh, it's very intriguing to me. Uh, I, I'm thinking from a local planner's perspective. So uh, if I am planning, uh, uh, post growth for me is a bit uh, ambiguous. So what growth are we talking about? Is it the economy or the population or land consumption or uh, uh, resource consumption uh, because uh, when uh, I also study shrinking city, when uh, we look at shrinking cities, so their growth is uh, past, it's past, but uh, they have a range of social uh, problems and uh, uh, infrastructure problems and uh, uh, without the hope of uh, economic growth or, or uh, the distribution mechanism in a capitalist society without a distribution mechanism, many young people don't have an opportunity in the future. So if I were to say we have a project that can enable the economy to grow in the next uh, 10 years, then I think most local people actually welcome it rather than say, I just, well, in other words, I just don't see much hope of finding uh, partners in such a big growth or post growth alliance yet. In, such a um, uh, political economic uh, background. What do you think? Like yeah. 
if, if, I, if, I, if I may may try to uh, to, to respond to, to your comment, um, I think it's a recurrent um, misunderstanding or maybe misinterpretation of the notion of post growth when when it comes to actual planning that people understand post growth as being the opposite of growth in, in the sense of uh, limiting or even shrinking the extension of urban settlements or to stop demographic uh, growth or, or the like. Um, th this is probably not meant by, by the post growth debate as far as I understand it. It's more about overcoming the growth fixation when it comes to the market logics and and this continuous need to grow to survive in the current capitalist e economic economic system. Um, overcoming this doesn't mean that there should be no growth at all. And obviously, there should be uh, even a lot of growth in those realms where we think economic or demographic growth makes sense um, or new settlements make sense. Um, it's more about the, the quality of what what should grow and what should not grow. Um, maybe the most tangible example is that if you could decide as, a, as an urban planner, if you could decide whether you attract a highly polluting manufacturing firm or something far less harmful to the environment, if you had, to, if you had that choice when it comes to zoning plans uh, for economic activities, it would be probably be an easy answer to that. So it's about questioning what's happening in terms of growth, what kind of growth do we want to have, and to what extent is that growth um, leading to resource depletion, further resource depletion, or less harmful to, to the environment, to put it this way. Thank you very much, Christian. Yvonne, you also did a very um, yeah, deep analysis of growth uh, or of dependence in, in England. Maybe you would like to add something from um, yeah, I mean, if I could I'll respond to the question from the floor and also what was said earlier. Um, I, mean, I think we need to be a little realistic about the role of the planner. Um, I mean, the planners that I educate um, go into either local public sector, local government, or the central government perhaps, um, or they go to work for consultancies who will be paid mainly by developers. So, you know, this is the role they're going to be playing um, and there is therefore constraints on, on what they can offer, um, either if they want to keep their job or in the case of within local authority, if, you know, if, if they want to respect local democratic values. So the question I think that, that, that um, our students often struggle with is, is how do they take all the great things we talk about in universities and then deal with that when they're, they're out in the real world? And I, I, think, I think the idea of scenarios is very intriguing, but I think for me, what planners can really bring to that is some examples of what has actually worked in other places. Um, and I, to link back to something Christian mentioned about the importance of land ownership. Um, and I think you know, the value of things like community land trust, community development trust, many of which underpin co-housing kind of um, uh, projects, um, their demonstrated value in particular places for producing something uh, in situations without having to be dependent on, you know, global finance coming in and building your condominium to buy to let, um, or indeed, you know, promoting more resource efficient lifestyles. Those are things we can actually demonstrate. And I think that is something quite powerful that planners can take from the university, from academia, out into practice, um, you know, in, in a legit to influence decisions in a legitimate way. Um, I'm trying to walk a tightrope here between saying planners must be political when I feel they're often not in the position to do that, um, but also planners are not, you know, can actually do something. They can work for change rather than just being, you know, passive tools of their or toys of their paymasters. Yes. I was just going to um, add to Yvonne's comments there. I think, too, that we um, look at housing communities and sometimes our focus is very much on the housing and how that is an improvement in relationship to mainstream housing. But some of the most exciting um, housing 
um, developments, eco-collaborative housing developments, actually expand and extend into, into work, into production. So uh, a colleague and I are editing a book at the moment as a follow-up to Housing for Degrowth, and it's called Food for Degrowth. And really, the self-provisioning and local provisioning of food is a completely alternative kind of way um, of producing as well as distributing and consuming food. There are people who are living in eco-collaborative housing who have makers' cooperatives, who have repair cafes, and all of these kinds um, of... This, they're almost like experiential laboratories for ways that we might be able to change our urban and rural futures. Mm -hmm. Are there any further questions? I might uh, have a... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can I? Yeah. Go first. <laughs> yeah. I, I go first. Yes. Um, yes. I'm also thinking a very tricky question about the democracy and the promotion of uh, degrowth or post-growth values. That's um, what is happening now also in Oslo. Um, well, in Oslo has been in the past uh, three decades um, practiced the densification strategy in the inner part of cities. So the planners develop um, um, apartment buildings in the um, in the brown fields, but also densify the single family house areas. But just recently, the, when planners want to densify the rich, the affluent neighborhoods that are so close to the city center, but are single family houses, they meet lots of resistance from these local people. So then I think it's really an ethical issue for planners. Yeah. And when they wanted to promote the degrowth value in a way densification, of course, we can discuss if it's a degrowth value, but it's for environmental sustainability. And then it's not accepted by locals and they are more probably Support more in support more the growth agenda and competitiveness agenda. So what to do and um, for planners and uh, just a, a a kind of a dilemma for planners. I, I mean, I think what often is important at that point is to think about the relationship between sort of national frameworks and local level. You know, the, and in some way, planners have to mediate between some kind of national strategies and these kind of issues, the dilemmas of local democracy. And, you know, and one of the things I, you know, I think we we perhaps collectively, rather than in terms of individual professional planners, can do is is, is to lobby for um, national planning frameworks which embody some of these kind of ideas. Um, you know, I think many national planning frameworks, you know, have have a nod to sustainability, but there's a question of then of how that's actually, you know, played out in detail. But it's I don't think the locality is always on its own in this. There's another question in this room that we would like to add. Thank you. Um, I'm not an expert on on um, degrowth or post growth planning as well, but um, my um, impression is that um, what, what I'm asking myself is. And um, is post growth planning really a, a useful framework as a kind of philosophy for planning or adds it something to, to other planning philosophies like just planning or um, sustainable planning and um, beyond uh, what it is already there? Or is it um, just a reframing of a, a lot of different um, yeah, aspects in planning like um, yeah, uh, social housing or uh, yeah, Mobility. Um, well, so, so my impression is that there there are a lot of good points that you make, and where I can see the, the uh, yeah that it is kind of post growth or degrowth. But um, I'm asking myself if it's um, really helpful to have it as such a broad framework, um, especially if it is kind of misinterpreting sometimes. Yes. 
I, I guess I guess the 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 plant the plant answer to that would be uh, every, every planning should be post growth oriented, and then we don't need this uh, this prefix any any longer. But you're, you're absolutely right that the term post growth, at least in in the the, the German the German uh, term post growth not degrowth, is rather irritating than uh, compelling to to many uh, planning practitioners, and as it as it somehow connotes. Some or associates with some negative development, some shrinking, some decline, and and this kind of misunderstandings we we discussed earlier. So, for for want of a better term, it's probably a means to describe that there's a necessity to reorientate uh, planning uh, strategies and ideas. But it's probably not a definite term we should use in the long run. But I'm not a planner. Okay. Other ideas from there, please. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's important to to interrogate the relationship between planning and growth. I mean, I'm not sure if it's it's an ideal label. It's not an ideal label that has political currency in the UK at the moment. But then we're in a bad way politically at the moment. <laughs> but I think if you don't interrogate the relationship between planning and growth, then you try to address these these agendas that the questioner mentioned um, simply by looking for more market-led growth. So you look for the way you know to achieve sustainability through ecological modernization, through win-win outcomes that will produce a profit and give some environmental benefit. However, you know, when when you look for it, or you try to achieve um, just outcomes by getting more private sector development to happen and then you siphon off a bit of that value profit to you know meet the needs of other parts of the community and it's almost i think um i think there's a there's a danger that it becomes quite lazy that that's that's the solution obviously what we do is we attract market led development and then we we get some environmental or social benefits from that and it becomes a very not say easy, but it becomes the accepted way of doing things, and then we are at the mercy of whatever you know, whoever happened to be active in the market at the time. You know, uh, which um, I mean, is that is at its worst perhaps in the UK, perhaps compared to the other countries represented around the world here, um, because you know we 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 have you know accepted the, the, the importance of the growth led approach for such for such a long time. And certainly, our current governments aren't going to move back on that. Yeah, we have one question on our online discussion board that leads in a similar direction. Like, it's not that easy. Then there's the question here do planners have to become politicians to realize degrowth? So, should we maybe just skip the idea of planning and become, become politicians and change that? What do you think on that? Anitra, maybe? Well, yes, right. I mean, I think that uh, planners are in a very good position to create, uh, to propose enabling mechanisms so that those people at the grassroots, for instance, people wanting to create eco collaborative housing or um, tactical urbanism, a whole range of innovative and useful ways of producing and living that mean that we're living more within our limits, but we're actually improving our quality of life and choosing what we do. I think planners are in a good position to try and see what ways the planning laws and regulations and policies can be revised so that it enables people themselves to be able to act more. And in that sense, I think they're like a lever, which can actually mean that a lot of other people can be doing work so that it's not all on the planners to do, make the change. So, for example, if you have Fridays for Future, how could we precisely, or like as a planner, support them best? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. For example, a Fridays for Future, like this um, young people, they go on the street here and everywhere. And we had a, a debate last year, and some young lady, she told us, yes, but we haven't changed that much, and they kind of got 
a little sad over the whole topic, and we were wondering how can we best support young people like Fridays for Future or different as a planner, maybe as a city planner, to um, yeah, put, like to don't um, demotivate to this, yeah, continue to be motivated to go onto the street. So what what can we do? I think I think planners are they, they can be enablers as Anitra put it earlier and 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 enable certain communities to do something but they can also be moderators and building bridges between different communities or between the more established policymakers for example and those movements you 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 refer to and by that maybe create platforms where um, the, the local democracy as we called it earlier can, can be played out and can and can discuss new um, targets, new goals for um, spatial and, and, and other developments. So if, if we take climate change mitigation or climate change mitigation objectives as, as the goal, um, post-course approaches could be a means towards those goals and how, and how this materializes the subject to, to negotiation between those various different groups. And I think planners are in a very central position to this process, or could be in a very central position to this process. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we at the uh, um, planners in, in practice, yeah, as uh, Yvonne just mentioned that uh, that those practitioners they are paid by the private uh, developers or by the governments they work for the government. So I think there is actually a limitation there for them to make this all these radical changes. But I think planning researchers they have a larger freedom and flexibility to do critical research. And I think more, if more researchers can be, can conduct a research um, that criticize the growth dependent or oriented planning, but simultaneously conduct innovative uh, research that can provide practitioners with knowledge and a tools for how to pursue the post growth planning, I think that would also be an influence um, from planners. And also I want to address that I think um, transforming to post-growth is not only um, a cultural or ideological issue, it's a structured issue. I think it needs changes in the fundamental economic system. And I think in that one, planners are quite limited in making these changes. Do you want to briefly add something? Because afterwards, I would like to ask the audience as well whether they have other questions. Yes. I'll, I'll be quick. Yes, so um, what I really think is that um, what planners can do is that they can run uh, some participatory exercises, work alongside community development officers who are working with younger people, and get them to model societies and, and different ways of living and do surveys amongst people and engage with younger people on what they want for their futures because I think that there are massive synergies once you actually speak with people about what they would like and what planners are thinking about and what politicians need to know. Well, it was just to, it was to pick up on, on Jin's point about structural change and suggesting that that was somehow out and width of the planner's competence, which, you know, in a sense is, is clearly, clearly true. But this goes back to thinking about the importance of small businesses in localities. I mean, again, working in Peterborough, I've been struck by just the very large number of you know, not, not just SMEs, you know, which are actually quite large businesses, some of them, but the micro, the very, very small businesses, you know, that are incredibly important. I mean, they're the ones where if you put money into those and get them to grow, they have the greatest local multiplier effect, you know, that the wealth state, you know, that they generate stays in the local economy. You know, they become a basis whereby, you know, households are able to actually sustain their livelihoods better. Um, so, I, I mean, I do sometimes think that, that and I've been aware that within, I've looked at planning documents, you know, that 
the knowledge about the, the local economy is all driven by the metrics that Christian's talking about. The knowledge about what the actual local SME community is doing is, is paltry. It's really, really small, you know, and yet it's just so many people. <laughs> you know, it may not be a lot of, you know, euros and pounds and bucks and what have you, but it's so many people. And it's, it's the ones that can contribute to, to driving local economic change in a, in a completely different kind of direction. So just trying to make the link with what Jim was saying there. Are there any other questions left in this room? <laughs> um, I see that you, you focus a lot on, on uh, the community as a yeah, kind of um, point of action for planners and uh, yeah, kind of orientation for, for post growth um, strategies. And um, what I'm asking myself is, um, if we should rather focus on institutions <laughs> like um, the financial system, the uh, housing market, uh, to understand what happens in the community. So um, we can probably influence um, or do small steps in the community as planners, but if we don't understand the, the institutional um, well, system behind it, um, it's rather hard to, to really um, yeah, touch the point uh, in it. So yeah, I'm interested in your opinion. I don't think it's an alternative. I mean, I, I think you do both. You know, you, you, you understand things structurally, you lobby for change structurally, but, you know, particularly in a country where that may not be happening, like the UK, then you take action locally. But maybe others see it differently. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree um, that I think uh, we need also changes in the institutional level. and. And I think why we are so have such a strong belief in economic growth and consider growth as the solution to every problem, I, I think that's because there is an inherent imperative of growth in the capitalist system, and when we give the deregulate the market and let the market to decide everything, then they have this uh, this uh, they they. Their purpose, their goal is for is for economic growth. Um, so that's the individual capitalist um, intention, and they at the aggregate level, it's GDP growth, it's economic growth. So I think if we don't remove this growth imperative within the economic system, it's hard to remove our belief in economic growth. Um, what you say, we also need. What even stronger planning policies, planning instruments, or weaker, softer ones? Because thinking about institutions and systems that inscribe what's possible could also mean make very strong planning instruments and very strong planning systems. Not to say who defines how it works, but uh, should we have stronger planning against, let's say, market forces, against other forces impacting space? Or would you say there must be a different way or how would that look like? Yeah, I, I, I think we, of course we need, we need tools. I, I mean, I think particularly, again, talking from the UK, you know, we have a, a lot of deregulation, a lot of weakening of local government in the UK. There's no control over land, you know, like I mean, it's being weakened in places like Norway, but it's still slightly different. We have, uh, little control of infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the anyone, you know, from within the UK planning system would say absolutely. Um, you know, it's very difficult to plan if you don't have some tools and levers to actually pull. I, I, I'd probably go beyond that and uh, not only say that we need a stronger planning and stronger tools and, 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 and more power in the hands of planners. It's more about um, the role, the role of, of the state, and by that I don't mean the, the nation state or the national government, but the, the public, if you like, the public uh, institutions, uh, authorities, councils, and the like. Talked about land ownership earlier as a as a key as a key issue here. So the question: uh, Who decides um, 
about strategies and where to go in, in regional development. Um, we, we heard earlier that the financial sector may play a, a particular role. If you look at the German banking system, but the strong, traditionally strong role of cooperative banks and local public banks, the Sparkassen uh, system, and if you look at their current policies, which are not necessarily that much different from the large private banks uh, in the global economy, um, there, there could be, uh, based on local democratic decision making, there could be a reorientation of investment policies, for example, quite easily if those banks were more in favor of supporting the small businesses uh, Yvonne referred to than mm. into uh, large investments and in the international stock markets and the like. It's easier said than done, I know, but um, that, that could be an entry point where we already have a structure which is prone to do things differently than the global capitalist system, but uh, yet they, they have to reconsider their, their policies maybe. Um, I was just kind of thinking that you, because many of our countries have been influenced by neoliberalism and, uh, and in Australia, uh, very recently, for instance, there's been, a, there's been a lot of discussion around planning because uh, governments used to, uh, used to have more interventionist policies that were very useful and still enabled there to be quite a lot of diversity on the ground, but were able to establish universal principles which have actually been withdrawn from. So, for instance, um, one of my colleagues um, and uh, another very well-known Australian planner, uh, Ian Lowe and Michael Berry, wrote um, an article uh, in The Conversation uh, in Australia uh, that was aligned with uh, an Australian New Zealand Society of Ecological Economics conference that we had. And, you know, basically they said no city in Australia really has a firm plan for the city. And we had hundreds of thousands of people um, reading that article and ringing up our centre and asking to interview them because... This is actually quite true, and it's and it's a it's a very glaring example of the fact that we do need interventions and these bigger, much bigger structural kind of changes, and they don't need to be opposed to what's happening on the ground. They actually feed back into those discussions uh, on the ground. We have that interest because at the most basic level. Many people notice this and are disturbed by it. Are there any questions left here? So we slowly come to an end. Yeah, so we slowly nearing the end of our discussion. We have to close some time because there will be a conference dinner afterwards. Um, but we are really interested in having you for here with a final closing statement when you look back at the last nearly one and a half hours and our, our broad discussion and questions that we had. One thing that we did not really address, what does it mean that we are here across five different countries, different legal systems? Um, we, are, we do not harm the environment that much today, so we reached the three hours limit this week, uh, three hours of internet this week, just by doing this round table. Um, but let's say we do not overstress the environment, but there is much that we can learn from comparisons and from our comparative setting here. So for the last maybe two, bit more than two minutes each, I would like you to give us an idea about what's what would you like to hear from others across contexts, across countries, or what is there that we should better take up? It just gives belief in the common challenge. Uh, so what can we do with that? And the second related question, as there are many planners in this room, so what can they all do tomorrow to then work towards this direction that we've discussed and then to maybe shift the boundary or enhance their thinking? So um, I leave the order up to you, so who feels like you're able to do a first concluding statement?
I get, I get first. <laughs> Um, I think my closing statement would be that, in a sense, there is no choice but to address this agenda, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, which most of um, us, us are representing here. I think if you look at the demographic patterns, the economic patterns, the outsourcing of economic activity, the aging population, um, our unwillingness to accept migration, which might revive that population, um, I think lower growth levels are almost inevitable. Um, I think, therefore, we need to to work to work with that. I think another aspect, perhaps a bit, a bit negative here, um, I think financial crises are few, in the future are also inevitable, and we may not be quite as good at bringing ourselves out of them through eras of growth as we did in t after 2008. I think we should remember that the GDP metrics are a kind of fiction. You know, when you look at them, the error term is huge. You know, and when you talk to people who work in, say, the UK Treasury, um, they spend a lot of their time thinking about the error term, not the underlying, you know, economic activity. They, they come up with these figures and we think they're real. They're not. And I think some of the, um, you know, the, the, the duplicity of these statistics may become more apparent in the next financial crisis. I mean, we have no idea if China's GDP figures are correct or not, you know. And to be honest, you know, how, how could we? You know, so I think both the kind of these socioeconomic shifts that are happening and because of the likely financial crisis the writing out of the kind of complete fiction or not partial fiction, let's say, of some of these, these economic growth metrics, um, we, this is inevitable. We need to understand this post-growth agenda. And what planners can do is they can understand it. If they're one of the people who understand that, then they can make a valuable in input into, into the discussions in their locality, nationally, regionally, whatever. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Who wants to give the next statement? I can. <laughs> um... I think there are maybe three points. One is, I think this, um, yeah, I share this point uh, uh, with Iwan. I think this non-growth or degrowth future is not only desirable, it's only not only because of the failures of growth in solving multiple crises, but also because it's probably a likely a condition that we have to deal with in the future because Economic growth cannot go forever. When you reach a certain point, then it's a steady state. So you can't expect um, higher and a higher level of uh, consumption. So that's not realistic. Therefore, this imperative uh, for planners to deal with um, post-growth is not something that we 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 think of a better future, but we have to. So I think this... Uh, one point. Um, the second point is, I think maybe it's also important to talk about what post-growth society looks like, because now there are so many different voices and even conflicts about what degrowth society is and what is the economy, what should be the political system, how it it can be spatially uh, shaped and formed, and so on. So without this kind of discussion or a co coherent narrative, it's very hard for planners to think about how to transform through planning intervention to that uh, future. Um, and I think that also leads to my third um, point, is that I think um, for planners, maybe it's more important that we become aware of the beliefs in growth, the political beliefs, and we don't, we can't just be passive recipients of political values. We have to be self-conscious um, of our professional values. Okay. That's you. all. Thank you, Christian or Anitra. Please, Anitra. Okay. Anitra. Thank you very much. Okay. So. Um, in the last six months in Australia, we've had uh, very severe bushfires. And uh, this has brought 
to the Australian public's notice that we really are having climate change. It's not a matter of when it's when it's going to have an impact. It's already actually had a massive impact. And uh, in November last year, my local community, I live in central Victoria, which is in the centre of the state. It's a rural area. And uh, we encouraged our local council through numbers of signatures that many of our electorate had signed a petition to declare a climate emergency to use as a platform for us to locally um, engage and plan for how we are going to confront that in our future. We're a quite bushfire prone area, although we were spared bushfires and didn't, weren't impacted directly. Um, originally, our council uh, argued uh, that they were concerned with declaring a, a climate emergency um, and uh, the, the uh, vote on declaring one lost five against and only two for. But they did say that what we needed to do was maybe have a full day discussion uh, that they was very well structured in terms of people giving presentations about their concerns about climate change in our local area. And that happened quite quickly. So by the December meeting of the council, the council changed their mind and six, four and one against they declared a climate emergency. And I think what we learned during that process is, is that by engaging with people, it's very, very important. And we started to get a stronger sense and respect for different people's positions and what their real concerns were in the future. And so I see that discussions, negotiations, engagement, and then people will all, always ask, well, this is all very good in theory, this is how we feel, but how are we going to apply it in practice? And this is what planners are very good at. How do we package this? How do we plan for it? How do we monitor that we're on our way out of this problem and addressing it well? Thank you. Yeah, three, three quick, quick points. Uh, when looking back at the roundtable we had two years ago uh, in this in the same conference, my impression is that things have, have evolved since. Maybe that's a random observation. I don't know whether it's due to the international composition of the panel um, or the people in the room. It's maybe erratic, but but obviously there seems to be some some momentum, and it's more than than a fashionable concept we talk about. It's something. It's an urgent need more and more people share, not least uh, due to climate change debates we, we currently uh, observe. And which brings me to, to the second point. Um, as there's no A to Z for post-growth planning to distribute to the local planner you mentioned uh, in, your, in your example, um, what, what I would hope for is that people who share this impression that things have to change in their everyday work as planners start thinking about what the, the notion of sufficiency could mean for planners. We probably have a vague mm -hmm. idea of what sufficiency could mean for us individuals, and Anita even provided us with a recipe or a menu at the beginning of, of, of this, this discussion. But what does it mean in concrete terms when it comes to land use planning, to infrastructure planning, to housing policies, to architecture even when it comes to the single object? What does sufficiency, how can we I mean, how can we enable sufficiency, sufficient lifestyles and ways of production? And finally, um, I realize the disadvantage of not being with you in Dortmund when I listen to Christian talking about the conference dinner. So I very much regret not being able to join this tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Chris. And we got another last statement uh, just sent to us uh, online from Federico Salvini, University of Amsterdam. So I will just read that out, another post-growth scholar. So he thinks, in his words, I think planners are today short of alternative imaginaries of social ecological organization. They got locked in the growth management paradigm of the 1980s and 90s. There is a lack of spatial imaginaries that connect localities, like those applying to the region as the ecological space of self-sufficiency. 
It is a post notebook challenge and it needs to tackle the uh, ecological and econo uh, evolutionary and economic condition within which localities can survive and autonomously provide for their needs. This is indeed a spatial and, and political imaginary. Political imagination is definitely a form of knowledge needed for planners today. So, um, from his side, we also get back to the idea of we need to be political, also politicizing in Anitra's terms. Uh, so, it's about being political, it's about developing alternatives, or at first about envisioning alternatives, or envisioning the idea of developing an alternative. Um, so it depends on where we start, but there are starting points. Um, we see that there's a long way to go. So we've seen each other on roundtable here two years ago. Uh, now we're two years further and there is still a debate. I mean, in regular terms, that can be quite a good sign that after two or four years, there is still a debate. It means there is something that needs debate. So we all hope that we can continue that debate with you four, our speakers today. Uh, you made this experiment with us uh, to test, do this with a kind of new setting that you for us uh, that made our um, IT, ITMC, our IT and Media Center, quite challenged here at the university to get all this work. So um, thanks to them, one of them, one of their um, employees is here. So thanks to that, them as well. Thanks to the School of Spatial Planning here, who also made that possible with lots of support because we needed much more technology uh, than usual conference sessions uh, at this conference. So um, thanks to the local organizers and our support that we had here. And a special thanks to Anitra, because you don't get that much sleep today. <laughs> so um, that's a special dedication to this topic. Uh, but also the same thanks apply to all four of you. Um, and we will continue that debate and, and take our ideas up from today. So we will get in touch with you to sum up our ideas and then also to make them available to all the audience here and all the people who have been here. Yeah. And maybe now we end like we started, waving at each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let's make a large wave. <laughs> then we are right. very much on time and Christian will do another dinner soon. And all the others, you're always invited to have a dinner with us, either in, in Hollingen, if you're there, in the Netherlands, in Dortmund. Um, so contact us and we will do a conference dinner in a bit smaller setting, but then we can do that. Okay, thanks to all of you. And thank you, and congratulations on getting this to work. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B